I, I just found out this morning that I had uploaded the, if you tried to watch this video, which most of you probably did not, but my online student when it says, let me know, I uploaded to this class the video from my second class. So if anybody tried to watch it, it was the wrong video. <laughs> I'm sorry that I didn't even realize that until this point. Well, I started using the cloud instead of my laptop to record those. And so that's what happened. But anyway, that's why it says that right here. Lecture one recording updated with correct video. <laughs> but um, that's just, it was more for my online class. And so they were totally confused. Um, one of those students is the ones who alerted me that it was the wrong video. Okay, so um, today there was another uh, confusion that I want to address, but let me go ahead and take attendance here. This doesn't look right either. It's not. Okay, Joseph Bond. Here. Okay, Brendan Castler. Here. Okay, Samuel Dolzel. Dolzel? No, no, Samuel Dolzel. He wasn't here last time either. Ty, that's when you just said you were here. Okay, Alex Freeman. Present. Okay, Mark Ge Gelfry. Here. I didn't say that right, did I? I Gaffrey, okay. Zachary Hall, okay. Gabriel Hill, okay. Catherine Howell, okay, awesome. Isaiah Johnson, Isaiah Johnson, okay. Haley Lashley, okay. Caitlin, Laney, John Marker. Do you go by John or John? Just John. Just John. Okay. Otta J. Oh, they were here last. Otta J. Martin. Adage. Adage. That's how it was. Well, not here. Chase Martin. Okay. There's Chase. Samuel Nixon. I thought there was another Samuel. Jamie Smith. Okay. Colby Tabor. Samuel White. We have three Samuels in here, but only one here today, right? Okay, anyone that was not on the list that's in here. Okay. All right, so one thing that I, I had an email on, and so I know other people were probably confused, is on unit test one, because in I, I talked about it a little bit, but it still may have been confusing, is that inside of Canvas, if you um, click on the unit one test, it says do August. Oh, I just changed it so that it wouldn't be different. But it did say it did say August 21 tonight. Okay, the purpose of that was like I told y'all in, in class was that I wanted you to have read the chapter before class today, because I'm gonna cover it. So I put that due date in Canvas, but what happens is whenever you go over to MindTap, it had a different due date of August the 29th. Well, you'll notice now they both say August 26th, so a totally different date. The reason I went to that is because the rest of the semester, when you have things due, they will be due on the Monday night, of our of our class so i want you to get used to that due date so um if there is a due date different than that i will send out an email okay otherwise the due date will be on monday night for assignments and and test except for the test we have in class okay so that way there won't be as much confusion but what happened last semester the way mind tap works if I don't leave it, it, it closes up on that due date and you can't see it anymore. And so now Canvas doesn't work that way. It just 
uh, it allows you to keep putting things in, it just marks it as late, okay? And takes points. <laughs> so that's the reason that I try to keep the uh, mind tap due date a little bit ahead, but I won't do that because it's confusing. But um, that's, if that makes any more sense and you're not more confused, that's, that was why the discrepancy in the due dates. So the way it's set now, since it was set for midnight tonight, I just went ahead and gave you till next Monday. So if you took the test and you don't have 100% and you want to have 100%, then that means you can take it up until August 26th, okay, to have 100%. If you're satisfied when you get a 70 or 60 or whatever, that's your prerogative to leave it at that grade. Any questions about that? Now, if you have a question, let me know because it's probably confusing. What's your name? Adage. Adage. Okay, I knew you were here last time, so let me go back. And, and what's your name? Which, same, there's two more. What's your last name? White. White, okay. John, did you? No, pretest doesn't matter. Um, in fact, it actually it does count, but it's like bonus or something. I can't remember how I have it scheduled in there. Oh. Yeah, yeah. The pretest is really just telling me like whether you've ever had any background in it or not. You were not supposed to make a good grade on that one. There's. What if you did like? That's all right, no problem. At least you probably learned the material better, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it's stuff that you're not supposed to know yet. Um, it's just to see, hey, if you have never read anything in logic programming, what would you, what would you know already? So that I kind of know where everybody's at. Oh, here's another one coming up. What's your name? Isaiah. Isaiah, okay. So I think that's everyone except the third Samuel. <laughs> okay, yeah, we don't have an empty seat, do we? Okay, so um, today we're gonna go ahead and start into the MindTap ebook into chapter one, and I'm gonna go over some things in there, and um, then we'll probably, I'm gonna try to jump to, before the end, to a couple of little problems so we can kind of start getting an idea of what this class is about. And hopefully, um, if you weren't here the first class period, then you can click on this link uh, and get straight into MindTap. There's a link, even if you don't want to purchase it today, you have 14 days. So this link that says click here to access the online textbook, you click there and then you have the option of starting a trial for 14 days. And so what I told students, is there's no excuse for being behind on any assignments because you haven't purchased the book because it's free for 14 days, okay? So you'll be able to get in and start right away. And then in 14 days, that free trial goes away. And so you have to either purchase the book as a one-time Cengage book, uh, which I think is $80, or you can purchase an access code over in the bookstore. And if you use a Cengage book in any other class, then it would be to your advantage to buy what's called Cengage Unlimited. But uh, you can do either one in the bookstore or here online. All right, who was not here on Monday? How many were not? Okay, Ty, I knew. And you were? Alex. Alex, okay. So after class, if you have some other questions, just let me know. Okay, and you can also view that correct video. And what you'll find out is anytime during my office hours, I think I did cover this, this Zoom meeting link. If you aren't on campus and yet you're having a problem with something and you've been coming to class regularly, then I will meet with you. Uh, I can do it either in my office hours or the Zoom meeting link. And uh, we can, I can share screen and everything with you. All right, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll also maybe look at this problem uh, today, this assignment, but um, right now we're gonna go back over then to the ebook 
And if you can't see from back there, then you'll want to just bring the ebook up here in mind tech for as we go along. Because I use that more than the slides, but you'll remember that there are study slides right here in flashcards that you can use for the chapter. And especially chapter one is more terminology than it is actually getting into the meat of logic. And so if you've been around, uh, haven't been around this kind of terminology, which I don't think any of you have not, when I started in programming in the 70s and my first job in 1979, I had never had a job in computer programming. I actually had a degree in elementary education. And so I would hear people around me talking about GUI interface and about all these acronyms that they like to throw out there and acronyms back then in the 70s it made you look really smart because you could talk in all these acronyms but to me um, someone that can explain what those acronyms are is a lot more intelligent than those that can just talk in acronyms but um, it, you know files back then even when they were talking about abstract files you know it was hard for me to to visualize that that's just like a regular file cabinet only on your computer. So there's every term that is used, even when you've heard this term over and over nowadays, viral. Well, that logically, if you know what in health, in the health field, what a virus does, that's what it is in computers too. It does the same thing. So they don't just pull uh, terms out of the sky. They actually do uh, logically mean what the definition of that word is. But in most cases, you can probably come up with exceptions to that rule all the time. Okay, so we're going to go ahead then, and what you'll want to do on your own, we watched this one last time in class, and it's on the video, and this one is the one on flow charts, which is a really good one, and if you haven't watched it, you can do that on your on your own. <clears throat> so, in this chapter, uh, we're going to, I'm going to cover quickly some of the terminology, and this is going to be the most important thing that we do in this uh, chapter, understanding the simple programming logic. And so, the things that are listed here, we're going to do the first three things this semester. We won't ever do this one, and we will um, test our code and but we won't ever put a program into production and we may do some maintaining which means making some changes but let's start up here then with computer systems what is a computer system and these are the terms that i was uh actually asking you about last time if you had ever had intro to computers or micro computer applications because these are covered there and these are terms that you've grown up around whereas like i was saying we're new in the 70s and 80s and when you were in school you didn't hear these terms but um what is uh the difference in hardware and software somebody tell me what's the difference go ahead jamie Very good. Those are two different kinds. The like programming is what we're going to learn just a little bit called applications programming, which is different than like when she was talking about the operating system. Uh, the operating system is like uh, on my Mac, it's OS X, and on Windows, it's what? <laughs> what? What's the operating system? That's the operating system. Windows. So then there's Linux, there's others. What's, what's anybody know any others? Yeah, if you're in, if you're in cybersecurity, you've got to learn all those. There's some different operating systems that you learn. But when I started mainframe programming before there were PCs, there were about three main operating systems and that was on just mainframe computers. So here, what we're going to be doing this semester is talking about programming, which is writing software instructions for the computer. So <clears throat> the computer, I always tell people, is only as smart as the person that's sitting in front of it. 
you may think that's not correct, but this, this computer only does what it's told to do. And so if when you're programming it, if you don't put the, the instructions in the correct order, it's going to do exactly what you tell it to do, nothing different. And so a lot of times we'll be sitting there and we'll say, I typed it in just exactly like it said, and it still doesn't work. Well, you're going to meet that frustration over and over and over again. So you have to realize that there's some little something that you missed. And so you have to enjoy troubleshooting to really be a programmer or really, really even an operator of a computer, right? Because there's a lot of things that, um, are, that don't uh, work unless we hit it correctly. All right, so what we were just alluding to is the difference in application software and system software. And we will be dealing with application software this semester, which is like if you all use Microsoft Office Suite, like Microsoft Word, those are called application programming programs because they don't affect the running of the computer. But some other system software is like the, the drivers for the um, printer. If you don't have the correct drivers loaded onto your computer, have you ever thought you were connected to a printer and it wouldn't work? You kept hitting print and hitting print and it wouldn't show up. It was because you didn't have the driver loaded. And it, now it's a lot easier with Wi-Fi printers than it used to be. And when I first started, I mean, every time I changed to a different, um, upgraded my operating system on Windows, you had to reload drivers. A lot of it's done for you nowadays, so you don't have to, if you have a newer, newer computer. So this book focuses on the logic. So these next three things that we saw in that little video clip last time are the three things that we talked about have to be in every program. There has to be input or sometimes referred to as the data items, which can include text, numbers, and other raw material that are entered into and processed by a computer. Now, right now, the hardware devices that we use to do that input are the keyboard and the, and the mice or mouse or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and then in, in the past, we had um, mainframe computers where the data was entered with cards, punched cards, and then reel-to-reel -reel tapes was the next one. And so you couldn't type right from the screen and get data in. That was something that came in about uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, with a type of a language called CICS, which is the first language I had to learn. It was an assembler language mapping. You didn't have pictures on the screen. You didn't have blank lines to, to enter in unless you had a, in business a programmer that coded in CICS and built that screen and you would have rooms and rooms of data entry operators. You've probably seen pictures if you've taken intro to computers and that's all those people did all day. Very boring. They sat there all day and typed in data because that was the only way all, and it, what it did and even in banks you had data entry operators and it would create a punched card that would slide out and every line, just one line of data was on one card. So you had stacks and stacks of cards for everything that was punched in. So it would come a long way and a little quickly. So then the processing of those data items may involve organizing or sorting them, checking them for accuracy or performing calculations with them. And those tasks are all performed, and there's one of those acronyms, by the CPU or the central processing unit. Every computer, no matter how tiny it is, even the ones in here, have to have a CPU. And when they were first uh, created, they were huge. <laughs> now they're tiny, or they can be tiny. But a CPU is kind of like what I used to call the brain. It's what, where everything is processed or runs through on a computer and does the calculations. But you don't even have to worry about that as a programmer, actually. We used to when I had to do a similar code. Output is after data items have been processed. The resulting information usually is sent 
to a printer, a monitor, or some other output device so people can view, interpret, and use the results. So if we didn't have output, when, when it would be senseless to do processing because we would never find out what the results were. So we have to have input to have something to process, and then we have to have steps that do something to that data and then create the output. Now, once you create the, the output, it can actually go to storage devices. What's, what's a storage device? USB. USB, very good. What's another one, Jamie? Okay, hard drive is what we, we use all the time. So when we say save in Microsoft Word, when you say save, it normally goes to your hard drive, but with Microsoft Office, they use virtual storage a lot now called OneDrive. Your Google Drive is virtual, your Dropbox. So virtual is like it goes up there in the cloud, okay? That is something fairly new but most of us all use that and some of us may not even know that's what it's called but when i first started teaching programming in 92 there was no such thing as cloud there was only actually hardly anybody even had a computer with a hard drive they have what was called floppy disk drives and so your computer had these little slots with a disk that was real flimsy not like a usb or a cd it was flimsy so it could get damaged very easily and you had to back up your data on there. If you turned off your computer before you backed it up on there, it was gone forever because there was no hard drive, no storage anywhere that stayed after the computer was off, unless you backed it up. First backups were actually a, a cassette tape. So there was a lot of, of we've come a long way. You can, you can program a computer without even thinking about it because you've been around it forever. But um, the cloud is what has made it so, um, so incredible to, for us to have data on any system. Even we can be save it here and, and pull it up here on our phone, right? So that's because of cloud storage. And so uh, we still have professors that don't like to use cloud storage. They don't trust it. Man, I'm telling you, that's so convenient for me because I go from classroom to classroom, device to device, and I don't have to worry. My data is always where, where I can get to it. Now, does that mean you can never lose it or it's totally safe? Probably not. <laughs> but um, as long as I've been in computers, I'm sure that they have all the data about me they want before I knew it was getting out there. So that's kind of, I'm not telling you that you shouldn't be securing your data. I'm just saying it, it's, it's something that we can protect ourselves to a certain point, but you know, all these breaches that are happening, I really don't know that, that there's much that you can do. And that's what really amazes me. You know, I also teach a, a social media class and I tell students, you know, do not put everything out there because once it's out there i don't care if snapchat tells you it goes away it never goes away and i have younger children to well, i have one that's 21 that's my youngest but all of them do not because they that where i they are private people so they don't put things out there but they like to look at everybody else's because they're so um young people today they say i i've had even elementary kids i say do, do you don't have any secrets no, I don't have any secrets. And I say, is there not anything that just you and like say your mom knows? No. Well, that's sad. <laughs> to me, that's very sad because you, you don't understand that everything you put out there, now, most of you all are, well, you all are, is anyone in here concurrent, a concurrent high school student? Okay, so what you need to be sure of, and, and right now it may not be important to you, you want all your friends to see what's going on in every place you go and what you're doing and how exciting it is and all these selfies. But when you try to get a job, it is there. I don't care if you did it in elementary school, if you put it out there, it's still there and they can find it. And so the issue is when you try to get a job, you know, a, a, 
a supervisor or manager of a company is going to say, oh, they do that. I don't know if I want them. Now, they can't tell you that's why they're not going to hire you necessarily, but I'm telling you that it will hurt you in the business world. It just will. And that's something that you need to be aware of. Um, I know it has nothing to do with logic, but I'm just telling you as, well, it kind of does. Logically, you should know that people are, are that are in management, they're looking at your character. They're looking at what you, what you put out there for the whole world to see. So I just am telling you that is something that you want to be aware of. And I mean, you make your own choices, what you put there and what you don't, but I'm, I'm saying nothing is secure. Just, and you should know, if you don't know what's going on in the world, you know about the big Capital One breaches, you know about, all of the data breaches that are going on, even in foreign countries with our data. So you need to be very cautious. So the instructions that, this is what we're gonna be doing. That, that was my soapbox. I'll try not to get on it too many times this semester. But programming language, the code is what we're gonna be doing in here, but we're going to be writing it first as instructions and not in a particular language. So it will be easier. We're just going to give the computer instructions like you saw in that little visual that we watched on Monday. Um, just uh, the things as far as even baking a cake or getting up in the morning, there's steps you go through that you don't even realize because you've done it so much, but you can't leave a detail out when you're giving instructions to the computer or if you switch the order and you put part of the ingredients in the cake before and bake it and then realize you left something out, that doesn't work, right? So it's the same way with a computer program. And it really is just as simple as you thinking through every step that you have to take to get to a certain solution, okay? So um, the, sen the coding of the program, that's what it's talking about there, right in the instructions. But then the syntax, and I talked about this a minute on Monday, but the syntax and syntax errors are just like every language that you speak in. Does anyone in here speak a foreign language? Besides, I mean, English is, is the, you speak Spanish? Okay, so you, not fluently, not fluently but you had to learn different syntax. So every, what do I mean by syntax? Now that can be somebody that doesn't know computer to grammar. Very good. So I have to know when I, when I took English, four years of English or uh, comp one, I had to know where to put periods, where to put commas, semicolons. I had to know my grammar. Well, every programming language has grammar. And so what we're not going to zero in on that in this class, you will learn a little bit of it along the way. That's the Python syntax because that's what length scripting we're going to use. But you don't have to know the grammar of Python to solve a program logically to be able to tell the steps that you go through to solve a word problem. Okay, you don't have to know that. So that's why we're gonna start with, go, and every test that I give you hands-on, the, the flowchart and the pseudocode will have more credit than the Python because I'm wanting you to learn, <coughs> excuse me, the logic behind um, solving a problem. So the syntax also Python will tell us about. Okay, um, this um, shows how this right here shows how a statement like, like, or a program like hello in some common programming languages, how different it is. In Python, you would simply type in print hello and, the, and run it and the computer would come back and say hello. That's all there is to it. But you'll notice the syntax like in Java, you gotta remember all these periods, you gotta remember um, now, this is the same in most every language. If you want something to print uh, in, if you want it to print exactly like it is back to the screen, it's usually in quotes, like even it is here in Python. COBOL, that was the first language that I ever learned, is uh, like that, which they, that's just called legacy code nowadays. Most, some of the state um, programs still run in it. 
So those are just different languages and the only one that we're gonna even touch on, I may show you some things in other languages, but this is the one that we're gonna look at. So after you learn French, and this is what I was talking about, you automatically know or can easily figure out many Spanish words. Similarly, after you learn one programming language, it is much easier to understand other languages. And that's why we start with Python because it's, it's more English language like, and so uh, it's more just like your pseudocode. So once you learn the logic, then it's much easier to learn other languages. When I was in school, I had to take a class called programming languages. When I got my, my computer science degree, I had to learn in 16 weeks, five different languages and they weren't scripting languages and they were horrible. I never even used them again. <laughs> it was just to show us they were called Lisp and Snowball and Pascal is still used some, but they were, they were crazy. Okay, so when you write a program, you usually type its instructions using a keyboard. When you type program instructions, they are stored in computer memory. Okay, so there's different kinds of memory and that's what you would have learned also in Intro to Computers. There's random access memory. It's a form of internal or volatile. What's the difference between the words volatile and non-volatile? Right. And non-volatile would be like the storage devices that we have, the USB, the hard drive, because it's permanent. So volatile means when you're typing in, the, pro the step that it's going through at that time is in computer memory. And when you turn the computer off, the things that are in memory, you lose. So, you know, back <laughs> the first PCs had like 8K of memory, which now we have uh, gigabytes of memory, right? And what the reason is because we like everything to run fast, right? So the, the more memory you have along with the, the type of processor really controls the speed of your computer. There's a lot of other issues that go in it, but it, it, you want to know that you have the fastest processor. If you're buying, every time you buy a computer, you want to buy the fastest at that moment because tomorrow it will not be the fastest. That's about how it goes. <laughs> so, um, it, but the thing, the reason I even work so much with Macs is because they last, that their operating system is a Linux based. And so the processor, like for instance, I bought my daughter when she was eight years old, a MacBook Pro for like a thousand dollars. Well, at when she was 15, it was still working and we got $500 out of it. So that's the difference in a Windows. Everybody said, well, I can't afford a Mac. Well, when you add up how many times you replace that PC or that Surface Pro or whatever, uh, compared to how, many, how often you have to replace a Mac, that that's just what you have to have to decide on your own. I go back and forth because I, st I started in PCs in um, that's what I had when I started here in 92 and that's all I had until 2006 and then I got a Mac and I never looked back. So um, all right so each pro uh, here's what here's the part that we won't be getting into this semester is the machine language and the source code and the object code. And so if you take, the only time that you'll work with object code and, and uh, machine language is if you take um, any, la any language other than scripting. Like if you take Java, C++, C Sharp, all of those require that you create what's called object code from your source code. So, other than knowing the terminology here, we won't be working with compilers or interpreters or the binary language. Binary is all zeros and ones, and that's how the computer works, is whether a switch is off or on, and that's all it knows. And it takes a combination of switches to make every alpha character, every numeric character, and that's, that's all that a computer is, is switches. And uh, those of you that are in engineering, tell me again, I know several of you all, you all will understand that, uh, you will have to understand that in engineering, 
but um, in programming logic, actually nowadays, unless you want to, and if you take programming languages, they will have you learn some binary and, and uh, other different codes, but or other different um, numbering based systems. So syntax errors are relatively easy to locate and correct because your compiler, which we're not going to be in a compiler, but our browser, well, we'll use PyCharm or Idle when we do Python, and it pops up and tells you the syntax errors. And so whether you've, you just have to figure out whether it was in the line before or two or three lines before, because it usually doesn't give you the exact word that you messed up on or something. It gives you real close though. If you write a computer program using a language such as C++, but spell one of its words incorrectly or reverse the proper order of two words, the software lets you know. And the, the thing that has happened uh, since COBOL, which COBOL didn't care about uh, the case of the, of the name, like whether it was uppercase or lowercase, but all modern object oriented programming languages do care. So in other words, if I write, um, if I write, I'll put a sticky note up here. Uh, don't let me in my life. So if I write a word and, let me make it a little bigger. And say I write um, num1 like that without a capital. Let's see if I can make it bigger. So I write it like that. And the next time I refer to that variable in my program, I call it num1. It won't recognize it because those are two different variable names. And that's one of them's uppercase and one of them's lowercase. So when a language says case sensitive, that's what it means. It means that it cares what the case is of the letter when you name the field or the variable. So um, although there are many differences, their basic function is the same in all compilers and interpreters. What we use for Python is actually called an interpreter. It's the browser is the interpreter, but it does it on the fly, so to speak. As soon as you start typing it in, it's interpreting it into the browser language. But when you're in a compiler, you got to wait. To, it takes all your lines of code, goes through and converts it to machine language, and then puts out whether you have an error or not. Okay, so it's a little different. After a program's source code is translated by the interpreter successfully or the compiler to machine language, the computer can carry out the program's instructions. So even though it's a different language when we're writing it, that's still not computer language. Computer still can't read it, even when we write it in Python. So the Python is the scripting language that um, it talks about. There's a lot of different ones here, Lua, Perl, PHP. PHP is used a lot on the web for web programming. Uh, scripts written in these languages usually can be typed directly from a keyboard and are stored as text rather than as binary executable files. So like C++, Visual Basic, a lot of those, they have to have a special editor. Like we use PyCharm or Idle, which is an editor for Python but we don't have to. We can actually code scripting languages in Notepad or in text edit if you're on a Mac. So it doesn't have to have an editor, but the editor alerts us of errors as we, as we type along and it gives you suggestions. So that's what makes the editor different. Okay, so understanding computer systems. Uh, as you go along here, these will, um, in the ebook, it actually tells you uh, what the answer to these are. And so when you, um, this is just ever so often they come up with these to see how much you understand. So two of them are true and one of them is false. So hardware is the equipment or the devices associated with a computer. Software is computer instructions. True or false? True. true. The grammar uh, rules of a computer programming language are its syntax. True. true. So this one has to be a lie, right? 
You write programs using machine language and translation software converts the statements to a programming language. So they got it flipped, right? Okay, so it tells you the correct one here. All right, so this is the part, and if the author of this book, Joyce Farrell, you'll notice she's got an accent if you've listened to any of these. She's from, I think, Canada. I can't remember for sure. But she's been around since, I don't know, I started, we started using her logic books when I started here in 92. So she's, we quit for a little while because she didn't include the new object-oriented uh, features, and now she does. So this little video just explains, and I'm not going to watch it in class, but I might, uh, so you can go back and watch it, and it's really good for my um, online students, but um, this tells you the difference in having a syntax error and a um, logic error. Well, actually, I'm going to watch this first one so you guys can see. Joyce Farrell. Let's take a first look at a simple computer program. Some basic programming operations occur in almost every computer program. First, there's input. A user puts some data into a program, some facts and figures. Input devices that are used include keyboards and mics. Sometimes input data comes on a disk. Audio data might come through a microphone. After the data is input, it's processed. The piece of hardware that performs processing is the central processing unit, or the CPU. Processing might include doing some arithmetic or sorting the data or organizing it in some way. After data is input and processed, you can output the information that you've created. Output is available for a user to see to see the results of the program. Output devices include monitors and printers. Audio output might come through speakers or sometimes output is sent to a disk and then that disk might be used as input into a new program. When programmers plan the logic for their programs, they tend to use one of two tools. Flowcharts are pictorial representations of the logical steps in a program, and pseudocode is the logical steps of a program written out in English form. Here's the logic for a program that adds one to a user's input number. On the left is the flowchart of the program, on the top right is the pseudocode, and on the bottom right is what the program might look like after it's been written and it's running in a command prompt window. In both the flowchart and pseudocode, the first step is to start. In the command prompt window, you might type a command to run the program. The command will differ in every programming language that you use. This program happens to have been written in Java, so the command is Java and then one more, which is the name of the program. In both the flowchart and the pseudocode, the next step is to input the user's entry. In a real program, you might add an output statement before input user's entry to explain to the user what to do. In this very simple example, on the output screen, we'll just have a question mark asking the user for an entry. And then the user types in some data, let's say 16. The next step in both the flowchart and the pseudocode sets a spot in memory called result to user's entry plus one. Nothing happens on the screen during this step. This processing happens in the central processing unit and in memory. So result becomes one more than the user's entry. The next step in both the flowchart and the pseudocode is to output the words one more than, followed by the user's entry, followed by the word is, and ending in result. On the screen, it says one more than 16 is 17, because 17 is the value of result. And then the program ends. You can run the program again. Start it, give the command to start it, ask for input, perhaps the user types 345. In memory, result is set to 346, but you don't see anything happen on the screen yet. When both the flowchart and the pseudocode get to the output statement, then on the screen you see one more than 345 is 346. And both the flowchart and pseudocode stop. You don't have to run programs in a command line environment. Some programs are created to run in a GUI environment. GUI means graphical user interface. For example, suppose
suppose you have the GUI screen that you see in the lower right part of the screen. In the flowchart and the pseudocode, you still start the program. You still input the user's entry. Let's say the user types 67 into a text box. In memory, the result becomes user's entry plus one. You don't see anything happen on the screen. In both the flowchart and the pseudocode, the next step is to output one more than user's entry is result. And on the GUI screen, you can see one more than 67 is 68. The flowchart and pseudocode for the GUI program are identical to what they were for the command line program. The logic is the same no matter what the environment is. Thanks okay. for watching. Okay, so in that, in her program, what were the, what were the variables? What were the names of the variables? User entry. There was one more. One more there. No? What was the output result. called? Result. Very good, John. So those were variables. Why, why are they called variables? They represent. And, they, and what does the word vary mean? Changes. It can change, right? So a variable is the name of something that may, the first, every time you run it, it's going to change. Whatever the user enters, user entry is going to become that value. And whatever the calculation of adding one to that variable is going to be put in the memory location named result, right? If it doesn't make sense, we'll go over and over and over it and you'll get it. Okay, so here it shows you some simple instructions. Some simple instructions that say, get a bowl, stir, add two eggs, add a gallon of gasoline. Oh, that doesn't go in there. Bake it 350 degrees for 45 minutes and add three cups of flour. So the dangerous cake baking instructions are so shown with a don't do it icon. So even though the cake baking instructions are English language syntax correctly, you notice then, but the instructions are out of sequence. Some are missing and some instructions belong to procedures other than baking a cake. So that would be called a logical error, okay? So that's the difference. So most simple computer programs include steps that perform input, processing, and output. Suppose you want to write a computer program to double any number. Okay, so they say, first of all, which in uh, the pseudocode, they left the start and the stop out, but it would say, input my number, my answer equals my number times two. Now, why didn't they say my number times two equals my answer? It's backwards. In when you learned arithmetic, you learned it that way, right? When you learned arithmetic, you learned to say, my um, answer equals, I mean, I'm sorry, I did it backwards because uh, that's the way I'm used to doing it. Okay, so this is the way that they did it on the computer right here. My number times two, right? Let me get it for you. Times two, all right? So that's the way you do it in the computer, the way you learned since you were in grade school, was my number times two equals my answer. So on the computer, it's just backwards because what happens, and what happens is this is a, it sets up a space in memory and it says whatever's on the right side of the equal sign, do it and dump it in here. So this equal sign is actually called an assignment statement. It's an assignment variable because what we're going to learn in Python when we do comparisons, we have to have a double equals, but we're not too bad yet. Okay, so when we use equal, we don't call it equals because it's not a comparison sign. It's not saying this value is, is equal. It's saying take whatever's over here on the right whatever your calculation is and dump it in this variable right here in memory and it's called my answer 
Okay, and then you wouldn't know what my answer is unless you have an output statement that says output my answer. So the number doubling process includes three instructions. The instruction to input my number, uh, the instruction to calculate or, or multiply by two, and then to output it. So here's the exact definition of a variable. A variable is a named memory location whose value can vary. That is, it can hold different values at different points in time. For example, the value of my number might be three when the program is used for the first time and 45 when it is used the next time. So in this book, variable names will not contain embedded spaces. For example, the book will use my number instead of my space number because a variable cannot have a space in it. There's different naming conventions that you can use and they're all legal. They all work in languages, but you want to pick one and use it consistently or you forget how you've named. And you can name, that's called camel casing. You can also, because it, does a different case when there's another word. So it went to capital A or capital N so that you would realize there normally is a space in there in grammar. Now what spoiled us a lot in, in DOS programming and Windows programming, when you go to Microsoft Word and you save a file, it'll put all those spaces in there, right? And it saves it that way. Well, if you try to use that, and interpret in a language, use it as a variable name or a file name, even when you're on the web, you can't use a file name that has spaces in it. It automatically puts percent signs in there and, you, and it's not the same as a name with spaces in there. So when you name a variable, be sure you don't have any spaces in it. You can use what's real common if you don't like the uh, words pushed together like that is people will use an underscore. So sometimes you'll see um, me code things like that. I'll say my underscore answer like that. You can do it like that and you can put an underscore in the place of a space if that makes more sense to you. So you can name them either way. I'm just saying either choose this way or this way so that you understand you know, when you get further down in the program and you refer to that variable, that you are naming it the same. So from a logical perspective, when you input, process, or output a value, the hardware device is irrelevant. The same is true in your daily life. If you follow the instruction, get eggs for the cake, it does not really matter if you purchase them from a store or, a har or harvest them from your own chickens, you get the eggs either way. There might be different practical considerations to getting the eggs, just as there are for getting data from a large database, as opposed to getting data from an inexperienced user working at home on a laptop computer. For now, this book is concerned only with the logic of operations, not the minor details. So a college classroom is similar to a name variable in that its name can hold different contents. Um, at different times. For example, your logic class might meet there on Monday night and a math class might meet there on Tuesday morning. So the instruction, my answer equals my number times two is an example of a processing operation. The, in most programming languages, an asterisk is used to indicate multiplication. You can't use an X anymore. But most of you in algebra, you already learned that. So this instruction means change the value of the memory location, my answer, to equal the value at the memory location, my number times two. So mathematical operations are not the only kind of processing operations, but they're the typical ones and they're the ones that we're gonna be working with first. Okay, so um, we, we already watched that video. Okay, now this talks some more about um, different things that are in Appendix A, the hexadecimal. And I'm not gonna go through this, but I wanna show you, um, 
Okay, that's the program development cycle, which you need to understand that, but I want it so that we don't, we don't fall asleep. We're gonna do a little problem. We're gonna do a hands-on. So everybody, if you have your laptop, you use your laptop. If you haven't logged into your computer, log into your computer. We're gonna write the very first program that you write in every language. Okay. You know what it is? What is it? Hello world. Hello world, right. Who's written Hello World before? All right, so everybody knows how to write, or not everybody, but some of you know how to write Hello World. So we're gonna do it in pseudocode, flowchart, and Python, okay? If we have time to do it all. So we want to go, if you weren't here last time, we went and built a, built a Lucid chart, um, or we signed into Lucid chart. So if you haven't done that yet, go to lucidchart.com and sign in for a free account. Don't pay for it. <laughs> There's a free one. Okay. So when you sign in, mine's already signed in. Let's see if I log out. So go to Lucid Chart, and there's a link for this in Canvas, but it's lucidchart.com. And then use your Raider email address for things that you use in uh, at Rose, because then you won't get confused. At any time you email me, I don't put the Raider in front of it. So then you create a, a password and then you should be able to log in. Okay, so when we do Lucid Chart, I'm sorry, when we do a flow chart and pseudocode, we come up here first to add a blank document and it should come up like this for you. Everybody get there? If I need help? If you haven't logged in yet, you'll have, you can go back. If you have trouble doing it in class, you can watch the video and do it again, okay? Because we're shorted on time, so I'm not have time to help everybody. But that's why I'm recording it. So here we'll go, and we're going to drag out like I did last time. Um, the shapes we'll be using is this one, and then we tell it next we want a parallelogram is used for every input and output, okay? So if you're inputting data, you have that. <clears throat> and the shapes are important. When I, the first test I give you, that's the one thing I want you to do is the right shapes and the pseudocode. I don't, I won't care about the Python. Next, we are going to do one processing step. And actually, we're not going to, let's see, this one won't have the processing when we do print hello, probably. But we're, we'll do another one too. Oh, and that's the output. And then I need the terminator. Okay, so I'm going to go up here first and I'm going to change. Oops, I didn't mean to move it. I'm going to change this to start. And you can, you'll notice up here it has all the same icons that it would in a word processor. So you can do alignment and line your data up. You can uh, change the text color, you can bold it, you can change how big it is. I usually try to make it a little bit larger just so you can see it back there, but you may have to watch the video. So then here in the data, this time we're actually not going to have any input for the hello program. There's not anything that, that you need. We're going to have one line of code when we do hello world. So here we'll just say input uh, actually, we could say, we could ask the user for something, but there's really no need to. So we'll just call it input, but we're not going to have any input in Hello World, I'll show you. Then here, we don't actually do anything to it either. We have one line of code, and it's actually the output. And I'll say, um, output, hello, world. So in this particular program where I, I already broke the rules, didn't I? I said every program has input, process, and output. But this little program only really has output. And then we go stop. Now, if we were writing the same one in pseudocode, then we're going to come here and drag a text box over here. 
and inside my text box, the first thing I do in pseudocode is I go up here and change the alignment to left top because I don't want it to start in the middle of my box. And then I go ahead and change this to about 12. So the, this should look just like my flow chart, but usually you indent underneath the start. So here I don't actually have any input. So I'll just put the word input just as a placeholder. So this will be like a template for my flowchart and my pseudocode so that the problem that I'm going to give you to do at home, you can use these templates. Input, process, which I don't have any processing. Then I have output, hello world. So I don't even have any variables in this one, right? So I say stop. All right, so now if I want to save this, so this you're not gonna submit to me, but if on your homework assignment, I tell you to submit it, we go up here and we do file, download as PDF, and then you remember my screen, I've gotta get it to come out of full screen so I can move it over because, oh, I can't get it to move over. Just a second, let me get it to move over. Well, let's see here, let me do this. And right over here to, to the right, you should have, let's see if it's gonna scroll over now. It won't even let me get out of here. Minimize. Oh, that didn't do it either. Come on. Where'd you go? It's that one. Okay, there's a little there's a little icon or there's a button over here, and I got to it last time. I don't know why it's not letting me right now. It's kind of locking me out. There it is. Okay, so right over here it says download. So you would click the download, and it asks you where you want to download it. So I'm gonna create a new um, folder. It says uh, 9.30 class. And I'm gonna put it there, but I'll name it. Like if this was your first assignment, then I would say assignment, whatever I tell you to name it, one, maybe DW, and it's gonna create a PDF that I can submit as my assignment, okay? So that's the first thing that I do. Now I'm gonna open, instead of PyCharm, I'm gonna do idle. So you should have um, Python there. Let me get out. So mine is, where's my idle? There it is. Okay, you should have a little icon of, well, actually on the PC, which I'm not on the PC, so it's gonna be harder for you to do. If you're on a PC, make this over here. Um, you're gonna go down to the start all programs and you'll see Python in your left in your left hand column. Let me switch it over. I don't think I have time. Maybe I have time to get it logged on here. How many of y'all are on the desktop? Mine's on your desktop. Okay, so let me go over here and then I'll put it up there too, just a second. Switch user. And we'll do the writing of the pseudocode here. I'm sorry, the, the Python here. Okay, I don't want in here. So go down. Oh, we're in Windows 10. I, I do not hardly know Windows 10. Windows 10, you know, is when Windows starts copying back and they don't do a good job of it. Okay, so if you're on your desktop, there should be, if you keep scrolling down somewhere, there should be Python loaded here. There it is. 
Python 3.7. So you click on that and then you see idle. Okay. So we're going to take that. And now you'll notice that it's in what's called the Python shell. And this is not what we want. So you go over to options. And once you do this one time, every time you open your Python in, in class, it will already be configured correctly. I'll show you on the Mac in just a minute. So here we do this. And we want to go over where it says general. And if where it says open shell window, you want to click on open edit window and tell it to apply that. And then say, okay. So now we're going to close this window and we're going to go down here again and open idle. Okay. And it's going to open different. It'll look like a notepad. So here we open it and it looks like a blank screen, right? So if we're doing, if you're doing it in window, here's all you have to say in Python, you say print, Instead of output, oops, instead of output in Python, print means output, okay? And then I would say, hello world. And it even gives you little hints there. And now if I click run, oops, run module, source must be saved. Okay, I'll save it. Um, hello. So you have to save it or it won't run it. And there it ran. So it went through the interpreter and the interpreter made it say, hello world. Now, if you're on the Mac, you have to go up here to the word idle and say preferences. And now if you haven't yet downloaded Python onto your Mac, you won't be able to do this because idle won't be there automatically. So you'll have to wait. Uh, and I'll show you later. So if you have it on the Mac, you would go general, open edit window, apply, okay. And so now the same thing happens when I open idle again. Oops, and I forgot to put it down in my doc. So when I open idle, uh, oh, I forgot to get back over there. Didn't I? but you'll see it's the exact same. So when I go here and I say print space, oops. Oh, I forgot my quote, didn't I? The quote is important unless I'm using a variable. Hello world. Okay, and so now I go up here and I say run, it'll say you have to save it. Okay, save it. Uh, hello, save, and there it is. So it does the exact same thing. Now, what if I wanted to say, hello world, and I wanted to add Professor Wilson. Oops. And now I run it again. I'll say, do you want to save it again? Yes, I want to save it again. And there it changed. So I can play with that. Now, here's something that is in your, um, let me go back to Canvas. And there is one called, there's an assignment here that says it's not due till September 2nd. But if you want to start in Python, this is one that I have a video tutorial, not from me, from this guy here, not as boring. And he um, goes in, he has a whole video tutorial on learning Python and he tells you how to install it. And he uses PyCharm instead of idle and it's just the editor. So if you follow him exactly, he will show you exactly what to do to set up Hello World. And then he has you draw a shape. He talks about variables and data types, working with strings and working with numbers. You can start that. That's not due until September 2nd. But 
you can do that and then when you finish it you take a screenshot and submit it in canvas but the other one that is due before that <coughs> But the reason I like you to do that one is because if you're doing it at home, it tells you how to install Python and PyCharm and how to use PyCharm to do in class, okay? And we'll do PyCharm next time I do a program. But here is, oh, this one didn't do till September 2nd either, but um, what, you can do any of the problems at the end of the chapter, but this is the one that you will um, do in, Second, and this is where you go to unit one in MindTap. And at the bottom, remember I told you last time where all the exercises are? Okay, these review questions will just be like the unit one test that you took. And then when you go down to where the programming exercises are, I tell you to do number two and six. So you do this one which is just in your own words, describe the steps to writing a computer program. So you go back to the chapter and put the exact steps, type them into a Word document, and or you can use Lucidchart and use a text box, whichever way you rather do it. And you will put that one and number six, which is to draw a flow chart and it says or write pseudocode, but I want you to do both in Lucidchart for this one problem. Represent the logic of a program that allows the user to enter two values. So how many variables does that take? If it says two values, you're gonna input two values. So you have to have two different variables, right? You have to say, ask the user, say, enter the first number and enter the second number. Okay, we get, we'll do some of these in class. If you don't know, if you don't have a clue, don't worry about it. And you would say the program outputs the sum of and the difference between the two values. So that's gonna be the first problem that you actually submit. But um, we will do some of these in class next time, okay? All right, y'all have a great day. And I will upload this by tomorrow. It takes a little while to get out there, okay? I will see you Monday.